Hi, I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, the latest report on homelessness, the numbers dropping nationwide, but not here. More talks in Washington about avoiding the fiscal cliff, but will Congress and the White House make a deal on time? Plus, California's relentless thirst makes the state's water footprint one of the biggest in the nation. And homeowners' long-cherished mortgage interest deduction is on D.C.'s chopping block. How its elimination could impact San Diego's economy. I'm Peggy Pico with those stories just ahead. And we'll tell you how this robot is helping prevent medical mistakes in the North County. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. A new federal report says San Diego had the third largest homeless population of any metropolitan area this year. The numbers come from a point-in-time count of homeless people in January. There were just over 10,000 in the San Diego region then. Only New York and Los Angeles had higher numbers. The Department of Housing and Urban Development says the new count is about a 6% increase over last year. Just over 25% in San Diego are listed as chronically homeless, being without a home for a year or more. And our homeless population included more than 1,700 veterans. Despite the increase in San Diego, HUD says homelessness has decreased nationwide by nearly 6% over the past five years. President Obama and House Speaker John Boehner were talking by phone tonight, trying to find a compromise to keep the nation from going over the fiscal cliff. Without a deal, mandatory spending cuts and tax increases go into effect in January. As Mark Smith of the Associated Press reports, the phone call follows a day of accusations from both sides. How the nation hurdles toward the fiscal cliff. When President Obama demands tax rate hikes on the rich. Republicans are saying, sorry, sir, you first. Where are the president's spending cuts? And the longer the White House slow walks this process, the closer uh, our economy gets to the fiscal cliff. To which it replies, here they are, in a plan Obama first proposed last year. This is a real document here with pages and tables and numbers. Now, I understand they may not agree with all of it. That's an understatement. Republicans say it doesn't begin to halt Obama's spending binge. But the White House counters it's way more specific than the GOP's been, either on spending cuts or taxes that must be part of a deal. Which brings us to the question of when the cliff would really hit. Yes, the tax hikes and spending cuts take effect New Year's Day, but Congress and the president need lead time to pass something, so the deadline for averting the cliff is probably next week. Yet even if New Year's passes without a deal, the cliff's impact isn't immediate. Treasury can delay payroll deductions if the deal seems close. Even if it's not, the average middle class tax hike is about $42 a week. And meantime, the White House can ease spending cuts by telling agencies to phase them in slowly. One impact, however, cannot be avoided. If markets suddenly tank, there'll be no doubt the cliff has arrived. Mark Smith, the Associated Press, the White House. Tonight, San Diego school trustees will hear preliminary plans to close an $84 million budget shortfall next school year. KPBS education reporter Kyla Calvert is in the News Center with more on this story. Uh, voters just approved new taxes for schools with Proposition 30, Kyla. How can city schools be facing another large shortfall? Well, California school districts are required to send in early budget plans for next year by December 15th, but they have to base those plans on projections that don't include revenues from the sales and income tax increases in Proposition 30. The first ind indication school districts will get of just how much money they'll get from those taxes will come in the governor's first proposed budget, which is released in early January. So are revenues from Prop 30 expected to close San Diego's budget gap? It seems unlikely that the revenues would close the gap entirely, but the district's chief of staff, Bernie Reinerson, told me that thanks to Proposition 30, this is the first time in five or six years that the district is expecting the budget picture to actually improve between December and January instead of worsen. KPBS education reporter, Kyla Calvert. 
Visitors to the Del Mar Fairgrounds will see some changes in the next couple of years thanks to an agreement signed today between the Fair Board and neighboring cities. KPBS reporter Allison St. John was at the signing and joins us now by phone. The agreements and more than a year of legal battles over the Fairgrounds master plan. Uh, Allison, what were the main sticking points of contention? Well, Dane, we all know about uh, what traffic is like when the racing season is on or the county fair is on. So plans to redevelop the exhibit halls and build a youth sports facility and a big new hotel really worried people living in Del Mar and Solana Beach. Also, the noise late into the night and the lights, you know, it's a big commercial enterprise right there in the River Valley, growing with no input from neighboring cities. But the new fair board, the 22nd District Agricultural Association, that is, they were appointed by Governor Jerry Brown, and they've worked with the neighbors and reached this agreement signed today, and there are some significant concessions. So is the fair board actually modifying its master plan? Well, yes. It's taken an option where it will not build the big hotel, at least not for the next five years. Board President Adam Day says he doesn't expect to see the hotel idea resurrected anytime soon, but, you know, never say never. So he wanted to leave that option open for future boards. The fairgrounds has agreed to do studies on traffic impacts and build a new lane on Via de la Valle when the new exhibit hall is open or is being built. And they say they support the idea of a new train station at the fairgrounds, but they'll let Sandag take the lead on that. They will eliminate rooftop lighting over 15 foot high, and they'll establish a noise complaint hotline. They say they'll turn off lights and have no amplified concerts outside of fair dates, of course, after 8 p.m. Hmm. And what improvements will visitors actually see at the fairgrounds? Well, the first thing on the list, according to Adam Day, is to upgrade the old exhibit halls. Those are those buildings that you can see mostly from Jimmy Durante Boulevard and I-5. The board still has to get financing for hundreds of millions of dollars before it can begin construction, but Adam Day says they may get started within 18 months. KPBS reporter, Allison St. John. A Somali woman was sentenced today in San Diego to eight years in prison for routing money to a terrorist organization in her native country. Nima Ali Youssef pleaded guilty last December to one count of conspiracy to provide material support to a foreign terrorist organization. She is one of several people in San Diego linked to al-Shabaab in a federal investigation. San Diego's Orchestra Nova is going out of business. It's filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy after an impasse in talks with the local musicians union. The orchestra wanted to hire musicians by concert. The union wanted its usual full season contract. Orchestra Nova had already canceled its season. To deal with the nation's growing deficit, lawmakers in Washington are considering changes to the mortgage tax deduction. Peggy Pico finds out what's at stake and how it could affect San Diego homeowners and the housing market. Senator John McCain introduced the idea of changing the long-cherished home mortgage deduction as a way to close tax loopholes and repair the deficit. Here to explain the proposed deal and the ripple effect it may have on San Diego homeowners, real estate, and the construction industry are Dr. Michael Lee, president of San Diego State's Corky McMillan Center of Real Estate, and Vino Pajanor, executive director of the Housing Opportunities Collaborative. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Dr. Lee, how much money would the Federal, does the federal government uh, stand to gain if, let's say, this tax is completely uh, eliminated? The estimates are uh, this year to be about $110 billion. It's a significant amount. Uh, there are several ideas on the table, including one from President Obama's administration. What is he putting out there? Well, he's uh, talking about not a complete elimination, but a phasing down in terms of reducing the maximum debt that you can deduct uh, interest on as well as uh, eliminating the second home uh, part of the deduction. And Vino, here in San Diego, I guess the a average price of a home, median price of a home right now is 385000 Would homeowners here be disproportionately affected by a reduction or elimination of this tax benefit because we have such high housing cost? Yes, I mean, California and especially San Diego has the uh, highest uh, home values in the country. And if the mortgage interest deduction is uh, completely eliminated, uh, homeowners are going to face the issue of uh, what am I going to do with my home, which is underwater. Uh, this crisis has brought about the fact that home values that were 500000 four years ago or five years ago are now like $250,000. So how they are sitting on the edge trying to calculate, like, do I stick to this home, I make the payments on time, or do I walk away? And these homeowners are going to decide 
you know, mortgage tax uh, interest deduction is gone. I'm going to make a decision to walk away. Our real estate market here uh, is still recovering. How would this impact as far as uh, your predictions of, of the real estate market? Would it hurt it? Uh, would it cause a, a lower home price set value? I mean, yes, it would. Uh, if the mortgage interest deduction is taken away, then is our country eliminated, it would affect the home values as well as the fact that homeowners might be disincentivized to stick onto their underwater homes. Home buyers uh, would be looking at these, the market and say, you know, why would I own a home if I could uh, rent it and pay the almost the same and have the other options of, you know, uh, paying the rent for the landlord and nothing else. And we'll come back to that because I know it's not a, a, a total factor in deciding, a, but I want to ask you, Dr. Lee, uh, the LA Times has a web poll on 81% say they are against changing this uh, mortgage deduction. It's a huge amount and a lot of the commenters said basically they were angry. Why are you going after the middle class again? Why not close tax loopholes with, uh, you know, businesses and corporations? Is this unfair? targeting the middle class? Uh, if there were a complete elimination, I think it would impact uh, significantly the middle class. But let's uh, keep in mind that the vast majority of the benefit of this goes to upper income people. That's because they own larger homes, have larger mortgages, and have higher marginal tax rates. So that uh, only half of people with mortgages actually benefit from this, and that uh, benefit is really captured mainly by upper income people. And I wanted to get back, Vino, you were talking about the, the, but all this discussion going on, uh, basically the tax interest savings is not perhaps the sole factor when deciding to buy a home? It is not the factor. It's not the magic bullet that makes a home buyer to become a homeowner, but it's one of the factors because when they do a back-end budget, uh, uh, the home buyer is saying that, hey, the mortgage uh, interest deduction would come in to help me with my daycare costs or my health care costs or something like that. So if it is eliminated, it takes away one of the various spokes that allow the home buyer, the prospect of home buyer, a uh, homeowner to decide whether they want to be a homeowner or not. It is basically giving the message out there to the community, home ownership is not the American dream, it's something else. What do you think, uh, Dr. Lee, that Washington's going to do with this? Are they going to deal with this right now uh, in light of everything that's going on with the fiscal cliff, or do you think this will be uh, addressed later? I think ultimately it will be addressed in the medium term. I don't think we're going to see the fiscal cliff uh, be resolved in terms of fundamental tax reform um, by December 31st. But I do think it's definitely on the table, and I do expect to see changes uh, along the lines of uh, reducing the amount of debt you can uh, deduct against as well as eliminating the second home. I think those are quite likely. All right. We have a lot more information on our website about this. Thank you both for joining us. Thank right. you. Thank you. Everyone makes mistakes, but mistakes in a medical setting can kill. So hospitals are stepping up to make sure patients aren't given the wrong medication or even worse, a contaminated drug. KPBS health reporter Kenny Goldberg takes a look at what San Diego's newest hospital is doing to prevent medical errors. People who work at Escondido's Palomar Medical Center don't wake up in the morning and decide to give someone the wrong drug. But no one's perfect. That's why Dr. Ben Cantor says Palomar computerizes the prescription drug process as much as possible. To ensure that when the doctor orders it, they're ordering the right dosage for the right patient. And then when the nurse gets to the point of giving the medication, the medications are all barcoded. So the nurse knows when they pick it up and the nurse barcodes her own badge, barcodes the patient, barcodes the medication. The system says, yeah, this is the right medication for that patient to be given at this time, nothing's changed, you've got a green light, you're ready to go. It all starts with a doctor ordering the correct drugs. The computer is key to making sure there are no mistakes in that crucial first step. So let's say you came in with something common like pneumonia. There are standards that every patient who has pneumonia around the United States should be treated in certain ways. We've built those into the system so that when I order pneumonia, a pneumonia power plan for you, it's got all of the standard antibiotics as they're supposed to be prescribed for you, all the tests that need to be done. 
The computer isn't supposed to allow a doctor to order the wrong medication or the wrong dose, but Dr. Cantor says it could happen. And if I meant to click this square and I click this one instead, I'm going to have the wrong medication potentially picked. However, there's a check on that and that I can't sign this without again reviewing everything. There's another check built into the system in Palomar's in-house pharmacy. When orders are placed in our computer system um, from physicians, our pharmacist reviews those orders. They say, yep, it's an appropriate order for this patient based on their age, their weight, their allergy information, if they have any clinical uh, conditions. It's the appropriate drug for them. Then that populates to our box picker. The box picker is basically a warehouse for most of the drugs used in the hospital. Once an order is approved, the box picker dispenses it. A technician prepares the order and a pharmacist checks it again. Only then is it distributed to the patient floor. Most of the drugs Palomar uses are mass produced by drug companies. But when a doctor wants an antibiotic added to an IV or a special mix of drugs for a surgical patient, pharmacists have to make it themselves. That adds another level of risk. Take the recent case of a specialty pharmacy in Massachusetts that didn't pay enough attention to sterile practices. It's accused of making and distributing contaminated steroid injections earlier this year. The tainted medicine killed 36 people and sickened more than 500 in 18 states. Palomar Hospital custom makes about 500 medications a day. This compounding is done in a special area with restricted access, specially filtered air, and extra levels of sterility. To further reduce the possibility of contamination or human error, the hospital uses a robot called Riva to mix and prepare IV medications. It's a self-contained sterile compounding machine. The hospital uses Riva to make large quantities of IV products. We can set it to make certain batches of products that we know that we'll use on a routine basis for our patients and then we can free up our technicians to continue to prepare ready needed products for our patients. The robot allows Palomar to compound more of its own medications, thus reducing the need to buy from specialty vendors. This kind of control helps enhance safety. But all of Palomar's preparations mean little if nurses make a mistake at the end of the process. Upstairs on one of the patient floors, Nurse Pam White gets some medication for a man who has high blood pressure. Before she can give it to him, she has to scan his bracelet. There it goes. And scan the barcode on the drug. You okay? Okay. White says all of the safeguards make sense. They're great. We didn't like them at first because it was so much of a hassle, you know, but they're wonderful. No mistakes. Palomar nurses distribute about 6,000 medications a day. Kenny Goldberg. KPBS News. A carbon footprint measures the amount of greenhouse gas emission a business or lifestyle creates. And as Peggy Pico explains, there's new research on California's water footprint. The Pacific Institute looked at how much water a typical Californian uses in the ways you might expect, bathing, washing clothes, and drinking. But they also looked at how much water it takes to produce the items we consume. And all of that combined makes up our water footprint. Heather Cooley, co-director of the water program for the Pacific Institute, joins me via Skype. Heather, why did you look at our water footprint in such broad terms? Well, there's growing interest in looking at how everyday activities are connected to water resources globally. And so there is an effort and it's happening at international level. Businesses are starting to do this. They're starting to think about what their water footprint is. That is, how much water are they using for the products that they consume? And then how much, uh, where that water comes from. How were you able to get an accurate reading of, you know, this measure of our water use? Well, there's a group um, called the Water Footprint Network that has developed the methodology for calculating water footprints. And so what they've done is they've, they've calculated water intensity factors, that's gallons per ton of product, for different products produced around the world. Um, and we then combine that information with, with California-specific data and developed those factors. And then we looked at trade data, that is the movement of goods both into and out of California. And with those two numbers, we were basically able to, to come up with an estimate of the amount of water required to support California. What surprised you most? Well, the surprising findings um, were 
say the, the amount of water. So on average, the average Californian uses about 1,500 gallons per day. And again, that's a, a combination of our direct uses of water in our homes, uh, but also in, in the water embedded in the products that we're consuming. So that was surprising. It's a very large amount of water. Um, secondly, California is a net importer of water, meaning we're importing water in the forms of goods and services produced outside of California into the state. Um, for consumption here. Right, and we can't control what other states or other countries do for, the, for their water use. So what can consumers here do to uh, reduce their water footprint? Well, a lot of our water footprint, our personal water footprint is driven by um, agricultural products. And so that's looking at the, the foods that we're eating um, and also the, the industrial products we're using, phones, cell phones, those sort of things. Um, what we can do on a personal level is reduce the amount of, of, of our consumption and shift towards some of the less water intensive products, um, including moving away from sort of meat and dairy products. Those meat and dairy products tend to be very water intensive. All right, and then how can uh, businesses or policymakers, what would you like to see them do with this research? Well, both businesses and policymakers, and some are already starting to do this, to look at their water footprint, to look at not only only the size of it, how many gallons per day, but also look at where their water is coming from. And what that then can start to tell us is how vulnerable are our water or how vulnerable are our um, products that we're consuming, how vulnerable are they to water supply constraints in other part of the world. So how would droughts in, for example, the Midwestern United United States or in China and Mexico, how would that affect us and what can we do to try to minimize or mitigate that impact? All right, Heather Cooley with the Pacific Institute, thank you so much for talking with us. And also joining me to talk more about this and put it in context for San Diego is Ann Tart. She's executive director of the Equinox Center, a research and policy center based in Encinitas. And thanks for being here. Thank you. So you did a report also that looks specifically at water use in San Diego. What are some of your findings? Well, our report focuses primarily on people's residential water use at home. And some of our findings show that we can be 20 to 30 percent more efficient with water use in our single family homes in the region, um, which means that there's a lot of low hanging fruit still uh, in terms of outdoor water conservation as well as indoor water conservation. How do you think this Pacific Institute's report uh, could be used and uh, be helpful uh, in San Diego? Well, first of all, it gives consumers uh, more information by which to make more informed decisions, consumers and businesses. I think from the policy perspective, we can all, it will also help us think about our connections, for example, to Mexico and how water used in that country actually, and, and our decisions here about what we consume and what we import, um, how that can affect water resources in Mexico. Um, I also think at some point we might see a movement like we did with a carbon footprint to, for um, labeling of products around how, you know, how water intense are they, and, and that could be an interesting movement as well. And in general, there are some programs here to help people make this move, because I believe you said 30 percent of the water use in San Diego is in outdoors? Yeah, it's, it's higher than that, actually. I think it's 50, around 50 50%, percent, okay. yes. Um, and so, yes, there are programs. There are programs that um, help people switch over to more efficient irrigation technologies for their landscaping, um, incentives and rebates for uh, switching over to more efficient clothes washers and, and toilet technologies and, and all kinds of other options. All right, so there's help available mm -hmm. and charge with the Equinox Center. Thanks so much for talking Thanks with for us. having me. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour, the latest on Washington's fiscal negotiations, plus major demonstrations planned in Egypt. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. Former San Diegans Anne and Nancy Wilson are going into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Their band, Heart, is one of five acts to be inducted next year. The Wilson sisters lived at Camp Pendleton in the 50s and 60s when their father was in the Marine Corps. The University of California system is getting a lot of flack lately for its new logo. It was actually introduced about a year ago. The UC even produced a video to explain how the new logo was designed, but an online campaign is now pushing to get rid of it. Even Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom has signed the petition. He's a UC regent and calls the new logo a disaster. Administrators say they're listening to the feedback but not dropping the logo. They say it was designed for online use.
because the old seal didn't work well on digital devices. The seal will still be used on diplomas and official documents. Looks like an early taste of winter weather on the way. Rain expected along the coast by late tomorrow. It's expected to linger through the weekend. The Weather Service says inland areas will dry out a bit by Friday, but there's a winter weather advisory for the mountains with snow possible above the 5,000-foot level, so drivers are advised to bring chains. The desert will get a taste of this winter storm by Friday. About 850 kids are locked up in juvenile facilities throughout San Diego County, and most are required to compete in the President's Fitness Challenge. Juveniles at the Kearney Mesa facility are required to work out seven days a week, competing against themselves to improve self-esteem through physical exercise, a mile-and-a-half run, sit-ups, and push-ups. It helps because we're getting strong and we keep our minds off of, you know, problems and stuff like that, you know, and the staff, the officers, you know, they help a lot, you know, help us, talk to us about our problems, and, you know, they're really just trying to get us ready for life in general, you know, that's how I feel about it. The kids in this unit won a letter writing campaign designed to promote positive behavior. They were expecting to see players from the San Diego Chargers this morning, but much like the team season, the Chargers were a no-show. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.